I would say this is a challenge, maybe not on your part, but for the rest of the staff. When you will slack and say, hey, and then like pause, and then you're like typing everything else. The time between that hey and whatever, everyone's like, I'm getting fired, I'm in trouble. To think that (laughs) you guys interpret my haze as like, it's over. (laughs) Literally, it's like, I'm fired. Oh my God, we we don't, I don't, (laughs) has anybody been fired here? Today, we are talking about generational divides in communication. So working with a lot of different generations and a younger workforce right now, we've been observing a lot of miscommunications, and I thought it would be a great time for us to bring in a few subject matter experts. So today, I'm talking to founder and CEO George, uh, project coordinator Nicole, and we are of three different generations. So i um, I think the best place for us to start is to talk about how we've experienced communication in maybe from like school to workplace, because there's a lot of kids born digital now and you and I were not. Definitely not. So I'll, I'll let you start George and tell us a bit about as a Gen Xer, what it was like going through school, what kind of communication tools you had, and then moving into the workforce, like what you were using. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great topic and thanks for kind of structuring it in that way. So for me, you know, my my situation's a bit unique in that I didn't even know how to speak English because I immigrated to this country. So I didn't really learn English until I was probably around 10. So I had a lot of uh, apprehension with communicating in general because you know, coming into a predominantly English school Obviously, we had French, but, you know, I grew up speaking Armenian and Arabic. So I go into an English school and I couldn't speak. I couldn't write well. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had ESL classes. So I was, you know, like picked on. And that's that whole scenario growing up. Um, So communication was always a challenge for me. But I really love the language and I, I love literature. So for me, it was you know, a challenge. It was like, okay, I got I got to get I got to figure this out. But I did it the traditional way books physically writing on paper, yeah. that sort of thing, right? As I got older, f- I was fortunate that my dad was kind of, he was an early adopter of technology. He felt that it would help us become better at English. And these computer things started coming into the market. And he got us one. I still remember a uh, Packard Bell computer. This thing was gigantic. And we literally would read, like learn how to read on this computer screen. So I was an early adopter of technology, but that was my experience. So to this day, like I, you know, I'd love to hear Nicole's perspective and your perspective. But for me, communication was a beautiful mechanism, and technology helped me accelerate how I communicate mm-hmm. and how I leverage technology today is different than how it was obviously thirty years ago or whatever. But uh, yeah, that 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 was my upbringing in terms of communication. Now, before I move on to us and our experiences, I'm curious to know what age you had a computer and then what it actually looked at, like at that time, like, were you emailing people? So email, as far as I recall, didn't exist. So I got a computer when I was, I'd like to say probably around 11 was my first computer. Um, and this was that Packard Bell mm-hmm. machine that we got. And it was more, it was DOS based. So, you know, a lot of programming and knowing commands on how to run certain programs. And that was it. It was like word processing at the time was yep. not what we know today with Google Sheets and uh, Microsoft Word and stuff. It was very rudimentary, you know, open up a new blank sheet and start typing. No spell check, yep. no grammar check. So I look at some of my old um, stories that I'd read in grade seven and eight. I thought it brutal, <laughs> like, like spelling <laughs> mistakes everywhere. But again, it, it taught me, you know, I would have to manually correct spelling. It mm-hmm. wasn't told how to spell. Or my teachers would be like, you spelt uh, because it was a really hard word for me back in the day. Mm-hmm. I always spelt because wrong, like with a K or an OS or something, right? So I always remember that word and I never make that mistake anymore. <laughs> but you had to learn. You had to actually learn how to I'm spell. I'm not here in Slack just like BC all the time. Because. <laughs> so that's so funny. And uh, maybe we can touch on that yeah. later. Because one of my teachers in grade eight, she was really, and my uh, ESL teacher, Miss Miss Minifi, I'll never forget her. And I love her to death to this day because she would always tell me never to use acronyms 
to spell or never use short short mm-hmm. form because you'll never learn to spell the word. So when I see you guys using it all the time and, you know, acronyms are so huge for our industry, yeah. it's like, my gosh, like I got to recondition myself to use these, but I never use like BC or like LOL is probably my extent of my acronyms, like, yeah. you know, but I try to spell the word because I think psychologically for me, it's like, I need to spell it to learn it. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. It's just a unique way of communicating now. Right. Well, I, my experience, I, I also had a dad who was an early adopter in uh, technology. So we had a computer at a relatively young age as well. And I remember like having... um very much like email didn't look like email. Like you had to kind of like click around and like everything was very like text-based. So um, in high school, that's when I was like, the internet is like my literal best friend. I would log in, go on ICQ and I would chat with not just friends, like whoever did have the internet, but strangers. So I was very much like the, my parents are like, don't talk to strangers on the internet. And I was just like, whatever, like they don't know what I'm doing. Um, So I was very much into like, text-based like instant messenger type stuff chat rooms and everything from high school so I remember having my first couple of jobs when I was like in my later teens um you wouldn't have that in an office but email was already very much integrated into offices so I did a lot of reception type jobs where I did have to like receive emails and like communicate that way but I was answering phones and everything so it was somewhat of a digital workplace but um, not as much as it is now. Like there wasn't casual communications. So you have to understand how to like write emails in a formal way, mm-hmm. how to address people, like what to have email signatures and everything. And in, in that sense, like email communication was very like, still, it is a business thing. Right. Right. Um, and I feel like it was in high school, like taught a bit, like we had a keyboard in class. What the heck, what the heck is a keyboard in class? <laughs> right. Like yeah. it was called keyboarding. Um, but it was like learning to use these like digital tools because, oh, it's going to be part of your workplace. Right. Not to the extent that like we understand it now, because I think my first like iPod touch was when I was um, in my early 20s. Yeah. So, um, yeah, like uh, communications was like a little bit integrated, but I think I still worked in a workforce where like it was still very paper based. Everything was printed. Every single person had like in their email signatures that like, please think before you print this. And like. <laughs> Yeah. For the environment's sake, please think and like don't don't print this out. But you would still print things to give them to your manager. For sure, I remember that like it was yesterday. Like I still see emails now. Think of the but the environment people yeah. printing this. Like, yeah, yeah. People still print these things. I remember back in the day, it was very common. Yeah, you'd get an email, you'd print it because you want to read it on paper. Right. <laughs> it's like what is this? Like now, now it's like I, I don't remember the last time I printed an email. No. Well, like and fax machines as well so right. like when i did work in reception it was like the morning you'd get all the spam faxes and clean them out and like have to sift through them like that's weird totally. that's really weird like a, a fax machine to still exist but yeah. um so i am an elder millennial and in that sense like i think i've always had like this integrated kind of like went into the workforce with a bit of like the traditional paper and everything and then had to move into learning these new tools and these like new digital means of like communicating so that's that's my perspective nicole what about yourself i i want to categorize you in like gen z right yeah i i have a uh what's it called a like generational identity crisis where i feel like my birth year it's like the tail end of millennial but can also be the beginning of gen z yeah so i've heard like zillennials yeah because when i read gen z i'm like that's a bit too this way when i read millennial that's a bit too this way so i feel like i'm in the middle but Mm -hmm. um yeah i definitely feel like we I was like in the sweet spot of um, like the tail end of the analog world and the right the, the beginning of the digital world when it was really being used. And yeah, I remember like in grade three having computer class and you'd all go over <laughs> and play games and they would teach you how to type and stuff. Um, and then, yeah, going into the end of elementary school, then everybody got phones. And so I feel like by the time I actually got to a job that involved email communications regularly was my first job. Yeah. And because I had been using like MSN and like all these, like you were talking about acronyms and stuff, like growing up on that, when I actually had to start emailing professionally, I remember like my first week and my first boss, she called me over and she was like, your emails, like we, we need to talk about it. And I was emailing <laughs> wrong. Like she's like, first of all, why is there so many emojis? We had to get rid of all those. 
I didn't understand sign offs. I didn't understand why everything was broken a certain way. And like from a digital professional sense, I just felt so confused. Um, and to this day, I feel like I'm really like still learning how to um, work digitally professionally and even doing like my first presentations and stuff like just that communication over Zoom, especially was just really challenging. Um, yeah, that would be- it, it's it's challenging for any even for me like i it's not my preferred method of communicating through a screen I, my preference is to be very in person um so i i feel your pain mm-hmm. i don't think it's gonna go away anytime soon <laughs> yeah Get two years it. into all of this and we're still telling people that they're on mute we're still yeah. trying to figure out like your mic's not working your right. camera's not working and all these tech issues so okay. it's definitely all a challenge okay so now that we've established where we've all kind of come into like the working world with like different levels and forms of communication. I think the last two years have just kind of expedited that for everyone. No one expected us to have such a remote workforce, to to be so digital, to have so much happening where we're really, really focused on technology, basically. What are some of the challenges that you've had recently? Well, I think you mentioned it earlier. I think being exclusively pretty much on screens these days yeah. where every meeting is conducted through a screen. I think I've said this numerous times to, to most of you. It was such a, such, such a component that we used to take for granted when I could just get up and walk over to somebody's desk and just have like a two minute, just need an answer rather than now it's like, Hey, are you available? Yes. Well, not yet. Five minutes. Okay. Respectfully, that could happen in a workplace too, where they need a few minutes. You don't want to be disruptive, but it's like, I got to set up a Google meet link, send it to you. You're going to click on it. There's going to be 10 seconds of like, Hey, how are you again for the 13th time today? Right. Um, 15 minutes set. Cause it's like the shortest meeting possible. You right. only needed the two minutes at the yep. start of it. Like we make it so formal. And then every day is filled with like 15 minute meetings to like check, check, check. Right. And I think that's the biggest challenge is it just becomes like, it creates this friction of like just being able to or- organically have things done. It's not organic anymore. It's very regimented. It's these 15 minute blocks and it's these, approvals that are requested for this time that's needed as opposed to just like can we talk Mm -hmm. do you have one minute we're just in passing i don't really need a formal meeting you're at the water cooler hey what happened with this oh got it thanks and Mm -hmm. we both go our separate ways yeah i think just before the pandemic had started we were like building out this office that we're in right now and we're talking about like okay what should this room be used for i think it was just like we started and we had this couch and like a couple of these chairs and i was starting to look into like workplaces that are you know desk hoteling because we were hybrid even back then Mm -hmm. um and a lot of things that i found were like you need spaces like the water cooler the the coffee machine, Mm -hmm. or just areas in which people can cross paths in which they don't work in the same department. Mm -hmm. And we've lost that because I was like, hey, I think it was early pandemic. I was like, I forgot Emma worked with us. Like, I was just (laughs) like, I just forgot. Sorry, Emma. Like, it was just like, I never have a meeting with her, never see her around or anything. And like, if you don't make that dedicated meeting with someone Mm -hmm. in this virtual world, like we, we don't talk. Right. But, um, I think I want to like veer back to like communication challenges around clients that we're feeling have like more challenges than us or even like how we're communicating things. Nicole, the reason I want to ask you this is we have like almost like a younger staff. Like Mm -hmm. a lot of my team is like that zillennial Gen Z. And I've had staff ask me like, can we get a little more formal training on emailing? Because it's like this art form of like, okay, what what is an email break down to? Like, what is the purpose of it? What are we trying to do? Are we working across emails? And then how do you choose to work through email versus Asana versus Slack versus a call mm-hmm. versus a meeting? And where does the, the work happen or where does the communication happen or the sign off or the approval or whatever? So yeah. my question for you is specifically in like emails, like how has that been a challenge for you? 
Oh my gosh. I feel like it's been a huge challenge just in the beginning. And you know this, like I I send Syl emails all the time. I'm like, Syl, I don't know. There's a lot of things I need here and this is a disaster. Can you please? (laughs) And when Syl like restructures my emails, I'm like, okay, she's using titles. She's using these bullets. She's using, so trying to learn how to get the client to understand what I'm asking and also to have it for my own records. Um, And then I remember also when I started here, I was, I would email the staff And so would be like, that is for a slack or that is a task for it. So understanding like where to compartmentalize everything um, was also definitely like a learning curve. Yeah. But yeah, I want also to talk with just quickly, you guys were talking about your schedules just now and like the 15 minute breaks. And I'll have moments where I look at like, especially your guys' schedules and you'll be like to the minute the whole day, like nine to nine, 15, nine, 15. And um, it just feels like, yeah, there's like. There's no more just like driving to a meeting or like, oh, I got caught in traffic or it's just like so, it's just a lot of things. Yeah. Remember when we would spend time driving to a meeting? No, it's been so long. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I think, you know, it's funny. It's funny that you had that um, need for email as like, help me with my emails. I'm finding that there's this uh, adoption of texting now as a form of communication that I'm not accustomed to. Like mm-hmm. I'm very email regimented. Like I am bullets yeah. and organized and titles and headers. And, and I, I think I had to explain to someone you'll do uh, a your hyphen. email titling. You'll start it and you'll put a hyphen because you went into the workforce and you understood formal communication where people change the email subject title. Right. And I had to tell Nicole about that. I was like, did you know that you could change the email subject title? She was like, no. I still don't know how to do that. <laughs> because because sometimes you'll start one off and it's called kickoff, but all the way down the line, you're like, I'm asking for an approval for this. I need you to send me these things. And it's like, it's not about the kickoff anymore. So you do like the hyphen thing because you're so email like old school I am. at this point. I, and, I, and, you know, and I'm trying to learn of maybe the newer generation of communication styles, which is quick text, Slack, you know, whatever. And I'm like, man, this is like, it's like, if you're open-minded, you're going to adopt it and learn, which I love doing because it's a different form of communicating. But I find with what I've become very accustomed to via email is I'm very organized. Like everything's in a folder for me. Everything's structured by certain tags so I can find things quick when it's like texting and I don't know how you manage it or the Gen Zanellials or whatever you guys call yourselves. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know how you can track that. Like, how do you organize your text? Because now it just becomes this big block of content. And they're not organized, yeah. right? And it's just it, like, well, it's the quick things that you need from like, someone. How can I, what's my take? Like, I'm always like, takeaway. What is my actionable item on this thing? Mm-hmm. In a text, I'm like, so here's what I do with text. Maybe I, maybe I just don't know how. I'm like, copy, paste. Then I send myself an email of the text. <laughs> Oh so that gosh. it's in my inbox so that I can address it there. And sometimes I'll text my, I'll email myself back my response that I want to text back so that it's organized in the text that then I copy and paste into that text. You know how hard it was for him to move from uh, Outlook to Google? Oh my goodness. Because you said you had hundreds and hundreds of folders and tags to organize everything. Thousands. Yeah. Yeah. And it took me a year to clean it up because Google didn't yeah. have a solution. Right. So just I'm an intense away at it. tagger of emails and like I've shown everyone, I'm like, I, I do it by client. It's a little bit color coded and filters are set up so that it automatically does it when they come into my inbox. Yeah, You just taught me that like six months ago. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I don't need this in my inbox. You're like, just do this, George. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, there's like a lot of features that yeah. like you can like, you know, just automate for yourself. But then I think we've had staff that left and then we inherit their emails and we're like, they never made a folder ever. Like ever. Every, every email was just loose in the inbox. Yeah. And we were like, what the? Yeah. But um, I think on the side of you saying like Slack is this new communication tool or this instant messaging in the workplace. I, I would say this is a challenge, maybe not on your part, but for the rest of the staff. When you will Slack and say, hey, and then like pause. Hard and then job. you're like typing everything else. <laughs> The time between that hey and whatever, everyone's like, I'm getting fired. I'm in trouble. Oh my I'm, I'm getting tracked down right now. It, it's over for me. I, it was so good working here. Like, 
And that pause between that, like, hey, is like, I think you don't think about it. You're just like, I just need to get in touch with you quickly. But for everyone else, like that sensitivity is there where it's like, you just want to be like, hey, and then like finish the message and then send it so that, that there's no ambiguity. That what you think? Uh, one time I was literally on a call with Sam B and he was like, oh, gotta go. Just got the hey from George. And like, just <laughs> ended. It <laughs> <And, and, and, laughs> Hang up. Yeah. That is so. I was like, understood. No, I get it. so yeah. bizarre to me. It's such a like. You know, I try to really, you know, I try to be as transparent with all of you. You know, it is so deeply ingrained in our values here. Yeah. Like that to 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 to, to think that you guys interpret my haze as like it's over. <laughs> like, Literally, it's like I'm fired. Oh, my I'm God. Just... We, we don't I don't. Ha, has anybody been fired here? Never. But it's like. <laughs> like uh, I think, like, we're all anxious. Like, we're all just kind of like, you know. I would say the reverse would apply then if I, if, if, like, it's, like, the other day I got a, hey, I need five minutes. I'm like, this person's leaving. Right. Right. Okay, it's like, oh, yeah. they're leaving. It's true. So it is, like, it does work in the reverse, but I, 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 I don't sit there and that's not the first thing that comes to my mind because I'm like, I think I'm pretty open and honest and transparent that if somebody needs me, yeah. they'll say, hey, I need five minutes. That's the first thing that comes to my mind. Not, hey... <laughs> I said, I'll, I'll try to not say hey. <laughs> Hello. Is that, no, it's, is, is it's just a trading without yeah. context. Okay. Yeah. Go so, on. okay. So that was like your, your gaff that, that happens at times where we're just like, oh my God, like this is like as a communication, I've told you before, I'm like, don't do that. Like, it's, it's just for, like, I want to say for the record, <laughs> I will never fire somebody over Slack. <laughs> Save that. <laughs> yeah. On, on the flip side of this. I want to call out one of yours. <laughs> oh, no. God. <laughs> yeah, but this is going to be really funny. Uh, it was, so Nicole just went into the general channel and posted what was, you know, to me, not a big deal, an album cover of an artist. Oh my and God. so it was Drake's recent release. But the album cover is oh. just filled with emojis of the woman who's pregnant. And I can't remember what, what you even said about it, but you just posted that and said, like, this is what I'm doing or something Yay, like that. Or like, excited. I don't know. What started flooding in? Congratulations on having a baby or being pregnant. Because oh, yeah. anyone that didn't have the context of, I don't know if it's like meme culture, keeping up with pop culture and stuff like that. But everyone thought that you were making a, a very special announcement. I remember reading the first, like, congratulations, and I was like, oh, I did it. Like, <laughs> I did something here. <laughs> so context is important, I think, is, like, what yes. we're what we're learning about, like, short messaging. Isn't that, like, the, the repetitive term that we've been using? Like, context? <laughs> I need Even context. Clients, right? Like, context becomes really critical yeah. to understand what it is we're trying to convey mm -hmm. in any message. So it's news to me that, hey, has turned morphed into this i'm getting fired so i'll, I'll try to <laughs> i think it's it's not the hey it's not the hey it's not the message it's like an unprovoked message from someone that's senior to you because it happens with me too and i think i've done it to people so so if we take a circle back to the water cooler uh -huh. or coffee machine or in our kitchen i would oftentimes just be like hey do you have a minute <laughs> And it wouldn't be because you want to get fired. It's because, hey, I have a question. Yeah. You know, or whatever. It was just so organic that, that and I think Slack. But it doesn't translate the same way. Sure, I get, right? yeah, you're yeah. right. It, in those tools, that mm -hmm. organic nature of, hey, do you have a minute, doesn't translate because you don't have body language to observe. Mm -hmm. You don't have the tone of the voice to yeah. listen for. It could be, hey. Hey, it could be, hey. It could be, hey. hey. <laughs> right? yeah, maybe if you added more wise. It yeah. would be a little more relaxed. Okay. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Right. And I think that like that sensitivity to typed language is like interpreted different by every generation too. Because I think I have a sensitivity to it where I, I can see in emails, if someone's typing me in all caps, I feel like older people sometimes do this, an all caps sentence or something. They just want you to see it. It's yelling. Right? Like it's yelling to me. If it's bold and then in red, it's like getting more aggressive. It's like very much the formatting of your text kind of determines like the tone you're trying to set. Whereas I think even younger people are more sensitive to exclamation points because if you put a space before you put an exclamation point, it softens it. Right? Yeah. Yes. Mm. <laughs> huh. Huh. Well, I know I, I did learn 
the lesson of the uppercase red. Yeah. I, I learned that. I did not know about it. I used to respond with color coded, like, so that, because threads used to get so long, you're like, okay, Absolutely. in purple, yeah. in red. Mm -hmm. At some uh -huh. point, you ran out of colors, right? So it's like, and this was my lesson that <laughs> I said. Uppercase it now, so it stands out. Oh, God. <laughs> now you're in red, uppercase. And it yeah. didn't always imply to me, or I didn't realize that sometimes that can be interpreted as a scream or a yell or whatever. Understood. It makes sense. I mean, it's, but you got to be, you got to, you got to learn those things. It's not, natural mm -hmm. as as much as natural conversation voice and your your varying receptors you know ob observation of body language listening for tone yeah like it's so hard to do that in these new mechanisms of communication yeah mm -hmm. like trying to express trying to express sarcasm trying to express like jokingness and stuff i think there's Gone. like new stuff that's like slash genuine to say like, you know, I, it's a dumb question, but I want you to know that it's like slash genuine or like you ask something this is a thing but now, slash too. sarcasm. Is I haven't heard of this. There's like indicators to just kind of like straight up tell people like how you're trying to express it because like there's so much lost in just like typing something out, right? right. The flip side though of no hay, if if I slack you guys. <laughs> oh, we're back to the hay, all right? Just, <laughs> yeah. just marinating. Okay. The, if, I, if I don't say hey and I just go straight question in slack, do you find it rude? Um, I, I try not to like, I try to, I try to connect the tone of everything to the person that I know. Right. Like I associate it to the individual. Now, if I've been, if I've been an asshole and I, I hope I'm never an asshole, but if I've been an asshole, if somebody's just rubbed me the wrong way, maybe the interpretation of that communication is different in that period of time. But I always try to associate it to the individual. Like I, I try to almost like act it out in my head. So if I'm saying hey to you, it's probably hey. <laughs> like that's how it, that's in my head how it's playing out. If it's like I need to have a conversation with you, that's very different than hey. Mm -hmm. If you're coming to me with like a straight up question, which you've done, mm -hmm. I'm not like, man, that's rude. She didn't say <laughs> hey to me. Like hello. Like how about introduce yourself first because I know you. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you have to be mindful of the audience you're communicating with as well. I see this a lot here and it drives me crazy when we, I haven't brought it up to anybody, but it is a little bit of a pet peeve when responses to clients or in turn start with, Hey, literally it's like, you don't. Hey, to me, is like you've broken the ice. But you're it's, talking about in an email communication. In an email, right? yeah, like email communication. Hey, when you say hey to someone, it's like slang. It's like chill. You're you're relaxed. You know the person. So you can say hey. If you don't know the individual, I would never go to anybody. Like a new client be like, hey, whoever. I'll be like, hello or hi or whatever. Are you talking about the hey dude that you discovered in like uh, some email threads? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who did that? <laughs> right? It's like, hmm. I think there's a there's a time and a place for for words, and I think we we've mm -hmm. said it in numerous times. Like, language is important, yeah. right? And how you use it is important. I think I'm grateful that I didn't know English for a long time, and I, it really took me a and I still learn every day. But it's it's awesome. Like, you got to be under, understand that you can't say hey to a client unless you've built a relationship. I think there's certain I it's know. professionalism and respect, right? Because I totally. think um, like. We're talking a lot about email and Slack and stuff. In terms of video calls, which is a relatively new medium to every workplace now, every every single workplace, I think there's etiquette around punctuality. Like we definitely try to make sure that we show up on time because we work with clients and everything. Um, and also focus, how we're conducting ourselves. What does our background look like? Are we in the car driving around? Are we, you know, walking around while talking to someone? I think as an agency, everyone is like at their desk when we're taking a client call, you know, or if you've got to be off camera. Now, have you all had challenges around video calls, etiquettes, or things that you're observing? Uh, well, as of late, <clears throat> I've had many, like where I'm, I'm very, I am big believer in respecting people's time. Because time is what we have on this earth. So when you're starting to take time away from me, I, I do take that as a, almost like an insult. Like my time's not as valuable as yours. I get their circumstances, you know, especially nowadays, people have things going on at home that we're not privy to, right? 
So try to be very conscientious of that and respecting others' time as well. Now I've granted I'm at fault for being late to certain meetings and I, I'm very apologetic and it's out of my control or it's just slipped through the cracks because I have so many on a daily daily basis. Um, but when I'm in the meeting, I try really hard to stay focused in that meeting. And again, I'm at fault where sometimes just so many things going on and I'm like veering away. Maybe I'm not the key speaker at that point in time in a meeting. So my focus shifts to like trying to get something done, which is a terrible habit to get into because you really, you'll miss that one key thing that, you know, you wanted, you were waiting on, but you've just missed it. So yeah, I, and I do observe how body language plays a role. Like our people, you know, the funny thing with remote is like, I have many screens on my desk. Some people have their camera here and they're looking here. And it's bizarre because maybe that's what they're using as their viewer screen. Mm -hmm. So you, you're not making eye contacts. It's really hard to gauge mm -hmm. if they're engaged in that conversation or not. To no fault of theirs, they just don't have the right setup. Yeah. Like ergonomically, maybe they're lower. It's hard to see if they're slouching or they're yeah. really – it's so many unique little challenges with this – type of communication. I think as humans, like you look for that validation in a conversation, right? Like we're talking right now, I'm seeing you nodding. I'm like, I am saying good things, you know? But like, if you see someone and they're just like, you're talking at them and they're just like to the side, not acknowledging and clearly typing, it's, they could be taking notes, but I think it's so tempting to multitask. Mm -hmm. Cause prior to this physical meetings, we were almost getting to the point where we we're saying no laptops, no phones at meetings. Because even in-person meetings, right. you could be typing and multitasking as well, right? So it was like getting to that point where it's like, okay, if we got a meeting, like it's important enough, don't bring anything except for a notebook so that everyone is actually focused on what's happening. But you can't see what's happening like in front of someone's face. Yeah, it's, it's tough and it's hard to gauge if they are in fact taking notes because some people like to, I'm, I'm old school in that regard. I like my notebook. I like taking manual notes because I have my little process but yeah I, I don't know that's my challenge i don't, I don't know but <clears throat> i find that the interruptions are more prevalent in uh virtual meetings because if you're in person yeah, you're sitting like this and you start talking i'm not gonna be like actually george one, one thing i want to say like but i find that uh when we're doing calls like even like internally or clients or anything that it's just more tempting to be able to interrupt mm -hmm. if that makes sense mm -hmm. and I don't know. I think you've talked about it before. There's like, if you've never met somebody and you have your whole relationship with them is just virtual, you almost lose that human factor. So being seen as like a full person versus just like the person that you email when you need things is like an interesting dynamic. Yeah. Like you're not just like an avatar of a person sort of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think like features are happening all the time on, on these tools, like raising your hand and like the chat box on the side and all of that. But it's like, is it, is it helpful or a distraction? It's an interesting, even the the psychology, the psychology behind raising your hand. Again, for me who came, like, I don't know what school is like these days. I would assume my children have to raise their hands to speak, which is very authoritative. Like there's an authoritative figure in the room. And in order to speak to them, you must raise your hand in order to ask a question. That to me is very an interesting dynamic when you're working with an Co colleagues of yours who you respect and you want them to interact with you and make that conversation feel very natural non-authoritative like to me this like i want to speak no nope, not you not yet <laughs> like it's such a it, i don't know that's how i feel like when somebody raises their hand it's like just say it what, what do you got on your mind but i in the in i understand in the interest of not being disruptive those those tools especially remotely they make sense but mm -hmm. it's challenging when you have this. I don't want to make it feel like this. It's this authoritative, authoritative, like it's my meeting and I will speak and I will let you know when you're allowed to speak either. It should be. I love conducting very natural, organic meetings, like where dialogue is flowing. And it's hard to do a flowing dialogue in Zoom. Mm -hmm. Well, the technological factor that creates that barrier is like that slight lag that you're not sure. I can read when one of you is about to speak right now, right. but like when someone unmutes themselves, like you can look for an unmute, but like sometimes two people start at the same time and you always get that, no, you first, no, you first, no, you first. And like in, in my team, it's always like, everyone's very polite. No, like you, you started first sort of thing. It's like, just someone say it like, you know, like just yeah. keep talking. But, um, that's, it's so hard to read. 
Like mm -hmm. you're also not like actively doing anything. You can't hear the their breathing, their body language, anything mm -hmm. that's connected to it. So it's like, how do you interrupt or intervene? And the, the muting is the polite part, right? So that you, you're not hearing all of the echo, the side noise, the whatever. Mm -hmm. Especially when there's a lot of people like in our, in our huddles, like when you try to, we're trying to do a natural conversation, but then you're like, so do you do anything fun this weekend? And I could be like, I did, but there's 20 people on the screen and oh, they unmuted and oh, okay, forget, we only have 15 minutes. Okay, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. It's hard. And you like, try to. When you ask a general question, what if everyone goes at the same time? I know, like, and, and I try to, I try to moderate it where yeah. I'll, I'll call people out, you know, like I'll call their name just to be like, hey, how's, you know, and I try to do that. And even that becomes you know, again, I go it's too back. regimented and it's too like, now you got to call on every single person. It doesn't feel natural. Yeah. Right. And you just want everyone to have an opportunity. Some, there are days where I get off those calls and I feel bad because I'm like, ah, I didn't get around to asking everybody. Mm. So I've changed my kind of script a bit just to change it up because <laughs> we've been doing these huddles and I'm so grateful for them. I honestly am. I think they're one of the best things we've done because of this remote thing the human connection that we're able to capture in that short 15, 20 minute period is so for me, very valuable to just be able to pick up on, you know, if somebody's not having a good day or somebody's having a great day or somebody's having a huge life event and they want to talk about it and getting to know each other better. It's how the hell would we ever do that? Otherwise we can't get together. We have to stay remote. We have staff that are literally not going to, we're not going to see them unless we fly them in. Mm -hmm. So how do we do that? I think the huddles are great, but yeah, sometimes it's just like, you're right. Yeah, maybe, I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is, but I'm just kind of going yeah. with it to be like, this day I'm going to call people's names mm -hmm. and this day I'm just going to open it up for dialogue and see where it goes. Yeah. I love the huddles. I look forward to them. And yeah, the so mix up is, I like that you do different. It's nice. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know of any other way to do it other than keeps us connected. And I think it's helped us as corny as it might sound, it's kind of grown the bond between a lot of people here mm -hmm. that don't get to see each other. Like you said, mm -hmm. Emma still works here. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's like, imagine we didn't have the huddle. You know how many people would be saying that about now? Who's, who's that? Like, we don't even know that person. We've hired yeah. so many people this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Know, who's that person? I don't, I don't, I don't know. What are their likes? I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know? And I think with the huddle, like the, the great thing about it is like seeing the whole team in front of you, like seeing everyone for at least a moment, you know, like we're all still around in a team. It's the the area where it doesn't meet is like that one on one where I think people have said, like, I've never met with this certain person ever in a one on one call. So we tried to like bridge that gap with like we have a virtual water cooler meeting. It's 15 minutes only. Anyone can drop into it. The funniest thing about it, though, is like a lot of people say that they go to check it each day. And if there's no one there, they leave. But someone has to start it to be there. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, no one goes there, right? I'm like, someone, somebody's got to be there for someone else to be there. Um, but that was like kind of intended to meet that gap of like coming across each other at the water cooler mm -hmm. and replicate that experience. But it's not accidental because you can also be like, mm, I see Nicole in there. I don't want to talk to her today. And you like leave, you know what I mean? I'm just like, waiting like, there. Yeah, just waiting. <laughs> I've done it before. I've and like done you, you it. I've been there go by sit there and you're just like, oh, anyone come in? Mm, nobody's yeah. here. All right. Yeah. That's cool. It's a water cooler. I'm out of here. I'm yeah. not going to stand by the water cooler for 20 minutes either <laughs> in yeah. real life. Just pop in. If anyone pops <laughs> by, then it's just yeah. like, you know, I'm open yeah. to it or not. But yeah. that's supposed to replicate it, right? Yeah. Now, in terms of all of our clients and everything, are there things that you wish they knew around like our communication channels and and all of that that would make your lives easier? Mm. One one thing I've uh, been doing lately, and this is just a personal decision on the way that I'm communicating, is I'm trying to adopt a lot more of these modern forms of communication, like texting clients. Ah, uh, yes. If I have their cell number, mm -hmm. like it, it does in a weird way, and it feels more personal. It does. I mean, to me, mm -hmm. it's like. It's kind of neater than if if a client texted me. I'm like, man, we've built a good, a different bond. There's a different layer of respect for each other. There's like, more intimacy, right? Yeah, they know my the private immediacy number, of it. Right, so it's kind of neat in that regard. So I'm exploring that, and yeah. it's kind of working out kind of neat to build better relationships. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, you know, one example like our transportation client who you and I spoke with numerous times. Him and I would chat about our man crush on tom brady all the time 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, be like, but we're texting each other. So it's right. outside of the, we're now building a relationship outside of the formal professional workforce. Right. And it's cool. It was a cool, I don't know, I'm finding it kind of nice. That's filling in a gap that we were lacking in which like, hey, be there to the minute of this meeting. Let's start the agenda immediately. There was no small talk, right? Like, I think mm-hmm. it's kind of like meeting that need there. Mm-hmm. What about you, Nicole? Um, I'm trying to think, but I guess one thing would be, uh, if clients, if, if something is wrong to just, just give it, just give it, just try again, just give it a second. Cause I feel like sometimes I'll get like, people will email me like it is text. So I'll get like, this isn't working. Oh wait, no, I think I got it. No, no, no. It's not in like four separate emails. <laughs> and you're like, and then by the time I get to it, I'm like seven emails deep. And I'm like, if you it's just, I'm going to, I'm going to answer you. Like I promise, I promise I'm going to answer you. Just, yeah. I'm just going to see if you can do it for like 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm coming. And that that even comes down to a style thing. I think there's some people who will, for all of those emails, there'll be four separate emails with four separate titles or the unhinged style where it's just a subject and no content in the actual body of it. Yep. Um, there, There's a style in which like that's happening. And I'm like, that is better suited to like a text-based communication, right? But I, I think I'd advise you once, Nicole, for clients that are very busy and not approving of things quickly or not writing back to you about what you're asking for them in emails to then break up the ask into all separate emails with separate titles because then they can digest each one close each one of them off and then like address them as needed yes because then the only bigger outstanding one that they might need more time for is just like one separate email on its own that's been super helpful and to the for the right client it works for sure Mm -hmm. well i think what we've learned today is any communications requires context. Like that's mm-hmm. it. That is the conclusion that I've taken from this. Mm-hmm. Any other takeaways? No, I think I think you're dead on. I think it's just context because you can read into hay as <laughs> hay. So obviously, context <laughs> becomes extremely important. So lesson learned. Um, I will do my. I will do better at context. But yes, you're right. It is absolutely about context, and we shouldn't shy away from communication communicating in certain styles for the certain individuals certain clients like you said works better texting i know works for certain clients that i've built relationships with hey might be taken as i'm getting fired what it may be taken as oh it's just george you know so i think you got to just always remember who your audience is as well yeah we're going to be very careful about niche pop culture shares as well yes yes, yes, yes. <laughs> congratulations by the way oh my gosh <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much both of you for this conversation it was awesome talking to you today thanks so thank you so if you're into web design digital marketing or management this is the channel for you we're going to continue to produce some great content so subscribe below or hit the little bell notification button to let you know when we post our next video